Um, I'm Danny Casborn. Like I said, good afternoon. I'm excited to see everybody here. All right. So, um, gastrointestinal chronic graft versus host disease is the topic for the day. So, um, what is graft versus host disease? Um, basically, it's the donor cells attacking the cells of the host. Um, they see the organs and tissues as foreign. They produce antibodies that attack the tissues. So any tissue in your body um, can be a site of graft-versus-host disease. Um, specifically in the GI tract, it's a very common site to have problems. Um, it causes destruction of the mucosal linings. This really goes um, from mouth all the way through. Um, it causes narrowing of the passageway and it causes um, an inability of the body to repair the areas of um, mucosal damage. So there are basically, graft versus host can be divided into two major categories, um, acute and chronic. It's um, divided by onset of time when you present with the um, symptoms. Um, acute is usually before day 100. This, these are the technical def definitions. Acute is usually before day 100. Chronic is after day 100. Um, what the majority of you are probably aware of is there's something called late acute that can hap happen after day 100. It usually coincides with the withdrawal of immunosuppression. And it looks just like acute. It just happens after day 100. So the technical definition of chronic graft versus host disease of the gut is esophageal um, desquamation, webs, and submucosal fibrosis leading to strictures in the upper third of the esophagus. What does that mean? That's a great definition for books and studies, um, but what about the other problems that um, patients and families struggle with every day? What about the rest of the GI tract? The esophagus is just a tiny little piece. So the GI tract includes, for the purposes um, of this talk, is the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines, both small and large, and our friend the gallbladder and liver. Some of the common problems um, that you're going to see, um, difficulty swallowing, loss of appetite, everybody's favorite, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea along with loose stools. Um, you can have abdominal pain, indigestion, just a chronic weight loss and malnutrition. Um, dumping syndrome, you eat, immediately have to go to the bathroom. It's hard to do anything, can't get out of your house. Um, you can only eat tiny, tiny little amounts of food, which in our society can be very distressful. Um, and then abnormal liver en enzymes. So these are, um, if you look at these list of problems, it, it, they seem very common, things that um, any of us could experience at any time. Um, they are things that you expect directly after transplant. You know, even maybe six months after transplant, you might think that you will still have some of these problems. But what about a year? two years, three years, four years after transplant, and um, you're still dealing with these problems. Um, eating is a very social behavior, as I'd mentioned before. Think about all the common celebrations that you and your families have enjoyed over the years. Um, are there any that don't involve food or drinking? Um, I meant drinking fluids, you know. <laughs> well, take what I say with a grain there. Um, so the most, 
the mo some of the most common um, questions, problems, complaints that um, I hear, and Sharice also from family members, um, are they just won't eat. Why won't they eat? How can I get them to eat? And the common response from patients, um, I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat. My stomach hurts. I, I just don't feel like it. I'm full. And this, this causes a lot of psychological tension, um, you know, to a very real uh, physical concern. So is it really, con is it really chronic graft versus host of the gut? Um, like I had mentioned, these things look common. Anybody can have them. Um, are you sure? Could it be something else? These are some of the other um, causes. Um, infections, side effects of drugs. You read any of the handouts uh, that come with your medications and all of them say that. Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, indigestion, um, constipation, absolutely. Con the, the opposite of the diarrhea, the co culprit constipation is also a very large problem. Um, lactose intolerance. Even though you didn't have it before transplant, guess what? You might have it after. Um, could it be food allergies? Can it be depression and anxiety? Um, a lot of people are afraid to eat. They're afraid that they're going to get sick. They're going to get nauseous. Um, they're not going to be near a bathroom. So those are very real, um, real concerns. Uh, Sharice is going to talk to us now um, about some of the tests that we use to diagnose um, graft-versus-host disease of the gut and then some of the different ways we can um, treat and deal with it. Okay. All right. So... <laughs> So Danny makes a good point about is it really GBH, and that's what we spend a lot of our time doing, whether it's your GI tract or it's your skin, trying to differentiate, and we're going to talk about some of those things, but also the medications that we put you on. I mean, how many medications are you on that we ask you to take two and three times a day? So your antibiotics that we place you on for prophylaxis, Bactrim, can be very <laughs> nauseating. Um, your antifungals, they taste bad. They, they're bitter, um, they can upset your stomach. Cellcept, gas, bloating, again, diarrhea, um, magnesium supplements that we put you on because you're on Prograf or Cyclosporin, so you need to be on magnesium, causes diarrhea. Your pain medicines, constipation and nausea. So we go through all these things. We're fortunate that we also have clinical pharmacists that work with us as well as nutritionists to try to decide is this GVH or is this something that we've added in. Sometimes it's as simple as removing one of your medications. So with diarrhea, when we're thinking of other causes, how about your chemotherapy, your conditioning regimen? A lot of the diarrhea that we see in that acute phase is early after transplant. Um, if you had a history of acute graft versus host, sometimes these symptoms just kind of go right into a chronic phase. Uh, we look for C. diff could be just an infection. We look for CMV. We look check in your blood. It can be negative, but if we scope you and take a sample of tissue, you can actually have CMV of the gut. That's not showing up in the blood. Again, medications, and then there are those viruses that you can acquire. Have you been in the hospital lately? You can pick up a lot of bugs there as well. So most of our GVH is actually your upper gut, and that's where we think of the feeling full, nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite. Your mid-gut type is more that diarrhea. Danny already mentioned that you lose that mucosal lining, so you get ulcers, you get bleeding, and that's where you have that watery, bloody, crampy diarrhea. Um, this sets you up for infection, um, as well as loss of nutrition. And then do you have problems swallowing? Typically, again, Danny talked about those webs, those rings. It's very classic when we have the GI docs go down and scope you. You can see these strictures. And patients who have esophageal will complain, I've got chest pain, I can't swallow, food sticks. 
And sometimes you actually have to go and have your esophagus dilated. And we have patients who regularly have to do that. And you think of patients who have sclerodermatous type graft versus host, so those skin issues with the tightening of your skin, same thing can happen in your GI tract all the way down. We look for CMV infection again, both in your gut and in your blood, and fungal infections. So some of our inf infections can actually look the same way. So again, we have acute and chronic. So with acute, usually it's not esophagus as far as the strictures go. It's usually more bowel, and that's where we see that small bowel and colon, and that's where we see all the diarrhea. With chronic GBH, we tend to see more of the skin, the eyes, and the upper GI. Now, the nausea, vomiting can happen throughout. And how do we diagnose this? This is why we ask you to give us specimens. You got to go in the cat, you have to go in the cup. We want to look to see, is this infectious? Is this something that we could simply treat with an antibiotic before we put you on two milligrams per kilogram of steroids? Um, do we have viral cultures pending? But most likely, you're going to have an endoscopy. That is the gold standard test. So if you're having upper symptoms, they're going to go down. <laughs> if you're having lower symptoms, they're going up. And they need tissue biopsies because that's what's going to tell us is this infection, is it viral, is it GVH? So histology is our gold standard test. So we send you to GI. Sometimes we have to admit you if we want it done very quickly. Sometimes you can also come in and just, we look at you and it's, we can't see anything in your skin. We don't see anything with your labs. But we could, you're losing weight. And you can get this hypermetabolic system with chronic graft versus host where you just simply, you're eating, you're doing all the protein shakes and that, but you can't gain weight. And that's a manifestation of chronic graft versus host. And it's very hard to diagnose sometimes mm -hmm. without biopsies. So our favorite treatments, always steroids. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. steroids are a treatment of choice for almost all of your types of graft versus okay. host. But only about 25 to 40% of patients actually completely respond to steroids. Um, we also have steroids that are specific to the gut. So budesonide or endocort, it's used frequently for Crohn's disease. We use it as well for GBH of the gut. It's, a t it's more of a topical steroid that we think isn't absorbed, but we actually know that some, for some patients it is absorbed systemically. As a matter of fact, we had a patient about in the last month who suddenly put on about 27 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, we stopped his budesonide, put him on some diuretics, pulled it right off. So he was absorbing it systemically, very cushionoid, I mean, weight gain all over. So some of these drugs are not benign. You know, we may say it's not like putting you on other steroids, but we still have to monitor closely. One of the other things that we prescribe is beclomethazone and corn oil. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a topical <laughs> treatment. It's, if you can get it down to mm. see if you're nauseated, this can be a problem. But it's a good topical treatment for that mucosal lining. Just a, it, the corn oil helps the steroid kind of stick to the gut to help heal it. Um, again, our immunosuppressive drugs, we have Cellceft, we have Prograf, we have Cyclosporin. We've started using Rapimune or Sirolimus a lot more frequent, um, more for your skin, uh, more for scleroderma type GBH. Monoclonal antibodies, um, that's something used more for acute of the gut, like Remicade, and that's usually when you're in the hospital. And sometimes we have to admit you, if you have if your gut is not absorbing any nutrition, we have to take you off of all foods, put you, give your gut total rest and put you in the hospital and put you on TPN. And you'll be on a, an assortment of all of these things. And this can be challenging as well. <clears throat> you know, we start you on one drug. That doesn't work or works a little bit. And then we add another. And then before you know it, you might be on three or four immunosuppressive agents. And we're not sure which one's even working or it's the combination, and it's, it's quite a process to manage and for you because you're on a lot of medications. So treatments specific for nausea and vomiting are immunosuppression agents, so continuing the Prograf, the Cellcept, the Cyclosporin, steroids again, it's always going to be steroids, and then using our nausea medications. So it's teaching you that if you know as soon as you take those pills in the morning, everything wants to come back up, 
when, you know, 30 minutes before you try to eat or 40 minutes and trying to find the right combination. There are some newer nausea medicines out that are patches that work for seven days. Uh, there's a chitral patch now. Sometimes it's hard to get with insurance, but that can be helpful to have that continuous stream of an antiemetic in your system. And then diet changes. If you know you're nauseated all the time or having diarrhea, we're going to go back to that bland diet, avoiding dairy, trying to avoid those things that you know trigger your gut. Moving on to the liver. What happens with your liver, we're watching your liver function test pretty much every time you come to the clinic. And we can see a rise in your uh, bilirubin or your transaminases. There are four labs that we're specifically looking at. And what can happen is your biliary duct can block, and then you get this bile that releases in your bloodstream instead of going to waste as it should. Now. Other things this could be, we need to check to make sure you don't have hepatitis. We need to look um, to make sure that you don't have iron overload in your blood. Every time that you've gotten a transfusion, you've picked up some extra iron, and that likes to deposit in your liver. So that's one of the other things that we have to look at. So we're going to image you. Usually it's an ultrasound or a CT. And then to definitely diagnose graft versus host, we do a liver biopsy. Outpatient, they go in like CT guided and take a little piece of it. And then we can put you on Ursodial. What's the other name for that? Actigal. Actigal is the other name. To help <clears throat> you get rid of this bile. So gut and liver problems in survivors. So the gut, we've got this, you can have this protracted acute. So basically it's just lingered on. It's not really ever gone away. You just kind of walk around with that nauseated feeling. Um, viral infections, we always have to rule out infection. Fungal infections are pretty common post-transplant. Again, chronic graft versus host if you've moved on to the esophagus symptoms. And then you can have a <coughs> visceral VC, VCV, which basically is um, a zoster in your liver that attacks your liver. So like shingles, the same virus, okay, so. uh, but not visible. We see it on the liver. Uh, pancreas, that's when you have that acute pancreatitis. You might eat, have that sharp pain. So these are the other <coughs> things that we're ruling out. And if you look at the liver continued, all the things, so if you walk into our office and suddenly all of your livers have shot up, we're going to assume that it's probably graft versus host, but we need to rule out these other things. Do you have hepatitis? You had a hepatitis panel before you had a transplant, but we're going to check it again. We're going to check your iron levels. We're going to scan you. We're going to look. Do you have fluid? Is your belly getting bigger? We're going to look for gallstones. We're going to look for obstruction because we want to rule out all these other causes before we say, ah, you've got graft versus host, and again, put you on these whopping doses of steroids. So, you know, GVHD is very common. It's very common in the GI tract. It's not always easy to diagnose, but we do uh, send you for endoscopy to have uh, that for sure. Um, we need to differentiate. Is it your medications? Is it something else? And we spend a great deal of time doing that. And again, steroids, they're the gold standard of care for almost all of our types of GBH, which tells us we need more clinical studies to come up with more answers because you just you can't stay on steroids forever. You can't stay on your immunosuppression forever. And not everybody tolerates steroids. I think we um, are going to open it up to questions now. We kind of sift through. A couple of questions. First one is, what is the latest um, time after a stem cell transplant that you've seen chronic GBHD of the gut? Do you sometimes see it like almost um, this very mild symptoms, occasional diarrhea, last few days goes away, recurs in a month or two, goes away, that sort of thing? Those are my two questions. Um, you know, the, a lot of those types of GI symptoms later in transplant are less common. The nausea, I would say, is the most common, and that's just that you can't quite put your finger on it. The, the watery volumes of diarrhea tend to be earlier um, post-transplant. Usually when we see somebody walk in the clinic years out, it's skin. Uh, skin though, or liver, 
um, eyes. And, yeah, you can see a lot of, um, it, it's very covert, just a, a malnutrition and a, a wasting. Um, usually not the episodic diarrhea that kind of comes and goes you can usually attribute to some of those viruses that you just catch in the general population but really late it, you'll see just a malnutrition so the, chronic, the, the recurring episodic diarrhea so recurring episodic diarrhea is not something you see and ends up being related to chronic GBHD no it can it, it's it, not it, common not, not commonly a lot of it is can be attributed to um, the treatments of. If you have chronic somewhere else and you're treating those, you can have um, some of the infectious etiologies. But the the volumes of diarrhea is not common to just appear later. Okay, thank you. And again, as Danny said, with the um, malabsorption, malnutrition, That's those are those patients that we were talking about that come in that kind of have that hyper-metabolic state. It's, they've got active graft versus host going on, and it's usually chronic, and you're, you're just, you can't absorb, uh, and you're just, you're going right through your calories and that, and that you're losing weight typically. Those are the patients that simply mm -hmm. cannot gain weight no matter what we do, and until that GVH calms down, it, that you won't. And that's why keeping up with your supplements are really important. My daughter is five years out from transplant. Um, before she was diagnosed, we found that she had AML due to being nauseous all the time. She lost about 40 pounds in a couple months from throwing up. And um, so after, after transplant, she still has nausea. Mm -hmm. We've done the upper and lower endoscopy. Mm -hmm. They can't find anything in there. Everything looks great. Mm -hmm. uh, they put her on steroids. She was on 80 milligrams a day and taper her down for like nine months. So she'll never do those again, mm -hmm. unfortunately. <laughs> now she's on cell set now, and we're, we weaned her halfway down. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance that that's just something she's just gonna have to learn to live with? I mean, there's no real damage done that we can tell. You know, they can't see it. Is she on antibiotics still? A cyclovir or? No, no, no we've pulled her off everything. Everything. Just, yeah. It, it started after she had not taken any medicine for like two mm -hmm. years. She came off her immunosuppressants mm -hmm. at seven months out. No acute GVH started about two years in. That, that seems to be a pretty common problem is just that underlying low-level nausea that you just have on a regular basis, at day, day in and day out. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah. I, I want to say she takes Finnegan for hers. Mm -hmm. The other things did not work. Uh, we used Finnegan paste while she was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if everybody is aware of that for people who still have nausea. The gel. Yeah, she, mm -hmm. This was a paste. It wasn't a gel. We didn't, the gel didn't seem to work so well for uh -huh. us. But we had our pharmacist, was a friend of mine, he compounded it for us. And it was more of a thick paste. But we were able to do that. So did she take it orally or was no, it, she, it topical? Okay. 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 I found the gel and the paste. Uh -huh. The paste seemed to absorb much better. Mm -hmm. And um, so we would do that about 10 or 15 minutes before she took her medicine. Mm -hmm. And then we could actually get her oral medicine down. Mm -hmm. It didn't take care of all the nausea. But I think they asked us one time how often she missed her doses of medicine. And I said she's never missed a dose. Just because of that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's a good idea. And some of the things, how old was she? Now she's 23 and she's had a transplant. Oh, that's a good idea. We don't mm -hmm. always think about some of those things the for topicals, the adult population. Yeah. You know, definitely use it in pediatrics. Sometimes, um, you know, we'll put people on just 20 milligrams of steroids a day, um, prednisone 20, when you just have that ongoing nausea. Um, not even necessarily having vomiting with it, but just it's not hitting you with that really high dose that we do other times, but it's enough that takes the edge off that lets you start eating again, and then we can wean down from that. Nausea is definitely a problem. We do that um, with just treatment-related nausea and vomiting, too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not in relation to graft versus host. Right, but so just especially for like patients, autologous transplants Yeah, patients afterwards. undergoing chemo, yeah. I pretty sure dilation is what they do they get into problems you think maybe removing um, is that when they have the healing 
you get um, scar tissue and more stricture. So I really think they they try to dilate if possible. And you can have it in the esophagus as well, you know, as in the intestines also. The intestines are a little different issue. Yeah. Rectal um, strictures are also a problem, yeah. And vagina for women. Yeah. That dryness and that t same tightening and sometimes dilation. Yeah, and I think well. they, they do do dilation for that mm -hmm. also. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and then having an endoscope done. And well, the he's putting that off. The dilation is um, it. Miss <laughs> Sheffield just had one this past <laughs> week. You know, so it's an outpatient procedure. They do it with the endoscopy. It's I definitely won't say that it's easy to go through, but it's pretty quick, and you don't have to go into the hospital for it. And maybe once a year, sometimes twice a year, and depending on the symptoms. Yeah. But it's usually things like breads and meats. Those are the things that just stick and you can't get down. A lot of times after transplant, people just don't want to eat meat. Anyhow, if you find that's Yeah, the case. Well, it's, it's not, and the danger tends to be, you know, it's difficult to chew and chew and chew and chew and then to swallow. But with that food getting stuck there in the stricture, is there's a huge risk of aspiration. And then that just sets you up for different problems, yeah. And one of the things that they want to make sure that, you, that, that your husband doesn't actually have reflux. So sometimes you can have reflux that's actually burning the esophagus, which is something and that causes strictures. And is causing that, yeah. not necessarily the GVH. And sometimes a scan can show you. Yes. Mm -hmm. you wake up at night and mm -hmm. you get no release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's reflux. Mm -hmm. what, I mean, what, what do you do when it happens like that? I mean, I tried uh, taking uh, pills and that doesn't work. Then I get constipated. And it goes from one extreme and then to the point where I'm trying to, uh, every so often, I can, maybe I've paid this 21 years, uh, but it happens any time. This past week I was sick. I ate something mm -hmm. and didn't digest or didn't work. Yeah. And I started cramping in the night. So I was weak all day, throwing up between that and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. But is there anything you can take that? We try to, try to keep... Um, everybody on a proton pump inhibitor or Nexium, Prilosec, yeah. Pepsid, yeah. those type of things. Um, there are things that can topically coat, Caraphate, which is a pill. It comes in a pill or a liquid. C-A-R-A-F-A-T-E. And, and that in the liquid is actually quite helpful. Four mm -hmm. times a day, you take it before meals. You take it about 30 minutes um, before you eat, and it actually coats the esophagus. I, I thought I was dying. Yeah, it 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 feels like you're having a heart attack. I drink tea. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The carafates is really good. Can prescribe that. Mm -hmm. And then avoiding the foods that you know yeah. trigger those symptoms. It snuck up on you. You try to go through the list and then you look and wonder, okay, what should I eat that was wrong? Mm hmm. And what does it one day might not do it the next day? Yeah. Yeah. The coat. The caraphate works very works very well. We've had a lot of luck with that. And there aren't other than it it's not real tasty. There yeah, there aren't a lot of um, secondary side effects with it. Yes, you can. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I actually have a question. Okay. So you talk about this continual kind of malnutrition where you just don't gain weight, don't gain weight. I sat through a talk yesterday and they said mm -hmm. eventually GVHD does go away. Mm -hmm. Years and years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it burns out. It yeah. Burns out. It so does. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> but she's 20. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, it, it kind of peaks around three years and then goes down. 
But again, we've got patients who are five years, six years, ten years, ten years. just have that little bit and still are on a little immunosuppression. It's, I think it's very frustrating for you because you go through this transplant thinking you're going to be done with all this, and this goes on. And then we might have a patient who had no GVH who walks mm -hmm. in the clinic three years out. All of a that sudden, has it's a like, look at my skin. I've got all these dimples, and it's mm -hmm. tight. And we see a lot of chronic scleroderma. Since we've gone to using more stem cells instead of bone marrow, we see more sclerodermatous graft versus host now. And I think a lot of um, what you're speaking to, you're 20 plus years out, uh, some of the things you may be experiencing that can look like graft versus host may be caused from the medications that you've been, they're not necessarily graft versus host, but side effects of the treatment that you've undergone all these years and then just the natural process of what that does to your body over time. You can get a chemical gastritis from all these medications. Mm -hmm. you know, we've gone in and scoped people, and it's like it's not graft versus host. It's just their whole esophagus <laughs> is just burning from all these medications yeah. we're asking you to take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every four weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's been 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. Some people's some immune system, system yep. never, never got back to normal. And, and some people yeah. just don't. And the, you know, so we will do the same thing, get you through flu season by giving you IVIG, just especially if you're having chronic infections. Mm -hmm. Does the weight ever go back on people? It does. <laughs> but it, it can take a while. I think I would have 115. And I weigh about 140 now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, it just came, and I gained this weight within five to six years. Mm -hmm. And then we start fussing at you because you've gained too much weight. Yeah. It's, but it's, I it yeah. I, I don't want to get too fast, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been, when I got to 125, I was mm -hmm. good. But I still would catch everything. So at the point I am now, it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to a point to catch things mm -hmm. and try to work with it. Yeah. All right, any more questions? You must be questioned out. <laughs> well, then we'll finish a little early. Let's thank Danny and Sharice for their great information. Thank you. Thank you.